Good afternoon. Welcome to the lecture series for the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities at Charlottesville City Hall. I'm Beth Taylor, a current fellow at the foundation, and it is my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Hermine Pinson. Hermine is a writer through and through. She writes poetry, fiction, nonfiction, critical essays. Her most recent collection of poetry is titled Dolores is Blue, Dolores is Blues. When she's not writing, she's inspiring. She teaches creative writing and African American literature at the College of William and Mary. This semester, she is a fellow at the foundation. Uh, this is her second return engagement. Clearly, she is an in-house uh, favorite. And this time around, Hermine is working on a memoir, Promise to be Water, a Memoir of Healing. And today, she will be uh, revisiting 1962, a year when she was a 19-year-old elementary student at a segregated school in Nashville, Tennessee. This, I think, will be a uh, pleasurable listening experience for all of us. Please welcome Hermine Pinson. Thank you. Um, and thank you to the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. Um, everyone has always been so kind. This, the title of this is A Very Good Year, and I was nine years old in 1962. <laughs> in my fourth grade photo, which is somewhere in one of the innumerable boxes I've packed over the years and put in attics or garages, I wore a burgundy plaid cotton dress a white Peter Pan collar, and a bright orange sweater, in fact, my favorite one. Two lopsided pigtails stood out from my head like lamb's horns. I smiled from ear to ear, according to the photographer's directions to say, cheese. My two front teeth slightly turned in toward each other, which made them look as if they hadn't quite settled. They were new to my face. I took that picture in 1962, a year of several incredible, indelible experiences whose impact I'm still discovering over 45 years later. Although I already know that to render this experience with clarity and insight would be like trying to catch fish barehanded. It was three years after my family moved from Beaumont, Texas to Nashville, Tennessee, where my father and mother set up house so he could complete his studies at Meharry Medical College to become a doctor while she supported his efforts by teaching in the public school system. It was the year I bonded with a group of remarkable girls and discovered my own propensity for language and performance. It was the last year I thought the national news didn't affect my life on the street in my on the street in my house. It was the last year before the deadly series of assassinations of public figures in the United States started with the killing of President John F. Kennedy and ended with the killing of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. For me, the sound of 1962 is not Ray Charles chart topping, I can't stop loving you, or Gene Chandler's Duke of Earl. Although our babysitter sat by the radio, babysitter sat by the radio or danced in their socks to these songs, I hear Let Us Break Bread Together, Kathleen Battle's gorgeous rendition of the simple but moving spiritual sounds, my early years in Nashville, in our furnace heated house on Scoville Street. Of course, the song predates Miss Battle's recording of it but her supple soprano with its perfect rendering of southern inflections and full vibrato unlocks a door to the time the Fisk Jubilee singers sang spirituals in close harmony in the Fisk Jubilee Chapel to an attentive audience of students, young women, 
their hair done in demure pressed curls and wearing their best dresses and pearls and young men in thin neckties, professors, families from the community listening and nodding in recognition and affirmation of communion and community. My mother and father sat with their then four, soon to be five children, she in her white gloves, content to listen to music she had grown up loving. Here, more than anywhere else, she was engaged and content. It was as if we were, we in the chapel, all loved each other in a way we all implicitly understood. In 1962, my world was bounded by my house on Scoville Street, my elementary school on Todd Boulevard, and Odie's Grocery Store, the John Calvin Presbyterian Church, and Fisk University on Jefferson Street. School days, Girl Scout shoes, book satchels, long waxed linoleum quarters, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, the flattened Scruggs early morning show on weekdays, the Twilight Zone on Friday nights, Hoss and Little Joe on Sundays, Bonanza and the Ed Sullivan show before bed filled my world. We were, after all, the first TV generation. The straightening comb once every two weeks in Mrs. Darden's close kitchen, careful play on Saturday so as not to sweat our hair back for church on Sunday. And in spring, grandmother made organdy dresses with bowed sashes the color of red maples. My parents admired the opera singer Leontine Price, who people said had conquered the Western world with her marvelous voice. They admired the Reverend James Lawson, Martin Luther King, and John F. Kennedy. So I did too, without knowing anything about them, except Miss Price sang beautifully, and she, along with the men, was the hope of the black community and nation. Grown-ups excitedly argued among themselves in living rooms and barber shops and churches across the city and the nation about what integration meant and whether it was a needful thing. I did know that I was a Negro, and Negroes were not always treated fairly by white people in America. You didn't see them in charge of things on TV. And one, when one did appear, it was newsworthy enough to call neighbors and friends to remark upon it. But the injustice of segregation, or even the occasional eruptions of institutionalized violence in the form of police arrests of protesters, did, didn't rend the fabric of our lives or seriously disrupt the day-to-day -day rhythm of life in our all-black community of mostly wood-framed houses, churches, schools, stores, gas stations, funeral parlors, nightclubs, and juke joints. My girl classmates and I wanted to wear pencil-thin skirts, mohair sweaters, and bouffant hairdos like the big girls who wanted to be like the singers of Motown, Martha and the Vandellas, or Diana Ross and the Supremes. I didn't know enough to want to be kissed by a boy. I still held my big sister's hand when I crossed the busy street. I certainly didn't understand the implications of living a segregated life. My parents had been undergraduates and sweethearts at Fisk before marrying and starting a family. By the time I came along, the second of eventually five children, they had managed to get through the familial milestones of christenings, first teeth, first step, first grade, chicken pox, vaccinations. They had also lived through the birth of rock and roll and rhythm and blues. By my ninth year, my mother still had her poodle skirt. The end of the Korean War and the effects of Brown versus the Board of Education, which commenced the modern push for black social, political, and legal parity in the South. To be in the South was exciting, but also stressful because if you were black, no matter how enlightened you perceived yourself to be, you could not escape the day-to-day -day indignities that defined the place to a greater or lesser degree. When my parents married in 1951, blacks were still sitting in the back of the bus in Nashville, Tennessee, and Beaumont, Texas. They still would not be served in certain stores or restaurants if they demanded to try on clothes or sit down at the tables. They could not be sure whether the policeman who stopped them was a fair man or an affiliate of the Klan's or white citizens' council. My parents brought the stress of these experiences home with them 
even if they had decided early in their marriage not to train their children to hate or fear white folks. They wanted to be one of the progressive thinking and acting couples they associated with. They once went to a fundraising fundraiser ball that featured Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte. On the other hand, it seems they were psychologically bound by outdated notions of marriage that said the wife's place was in the home and the husband was provider and last word on everything. Between the external pressure of racism and the internal conflicts that sprang from being two explosive, strong-willed, creative people, their tensions often combusted into raging arguments. As early as age three, I can remember the sound of raised voices and the occasional tussle while I listened from the relative safety of the bedroom where my mother had placed my older sister and me. As we grew, my siblings and I heard fragments of dialogue. I'm a man and this is my house. You are not my father and I'll do as I damn well please. We knew better than to ask questions about arguments the night before. That was grown folks business. Their arguments started over any number of things. Maybe as he sometimes tried to explain, he had stayed out late to play cards or to blow off steam with the other young doctors, or he had stopped by the Del Morocco to catch Jimi Hendrix and the King Casuals. Maybe he was worried about a patient and so sat with him through the night. For my mother's part, maybe she discovered a lipstick-stained handkerchief in my father's pocketbook when she was washing his clothes, or perhaps that same handkerchief was scented with another woman's perfume. Or maybe my mother refused to back down when my father said she should not risk her safety to stand on the picket line. Or maybe he tried to chastise her about staying out past what he thought was a decent curfew for his wife. Maybe the moon was full. Maybe there was no moon at all. My parents weren't always uncivil to each other or to us. They were capable of turning their attention to the business of family and teaching their children the meaning of doing well. They were no strangers to joy or beauty and often during periods of tranquility, they shared their beauty and knowledge with us from my father who enjoyed fishing. We learned the pleasures of going down to the river's edge to catch a fish or to bask in the rhythm of nature or to sit in the back seat on road trips and take my father's common knowledge quizzes to ward off boredom while passing through small towns at three in the morning, all of us in the car together going someplace far away. From my mother was the gift of literature and music, fairy tales, children's ditties, Aesop, Dr. Seuss, Dave Brubeck's Take Five, or Nina Simone, alone with her piano and her splendid rage, something my mother, a gifted pianist, well understood. We went as a family on site, seeing trips to Hadley Park or the Parthenon at Christmas to buy a Christmas tree in the temporary forest of potted trees, dwarfed by the formidable and classic lines of the Parthenon that had somehow landed like a space alien on a low hill in Nashville. When my father sang along in his slightly flat bass with Glenn Campbell, I wanted to believe he was the lineman from the county, and my mother was the one he longed for. Sometimes, especially early on, their friends, young doctors, school teachers, secretaries, graduate students, would come to our small stucco house on Scoville Street. They shared potluck dinners, wine, whiskey, and stories about difficult professors, difficult cases, the developments in the student-led civil rights movement, which had effectively integrated downtown lunch counters two years before with the leadership of students like John Lewis and Diane Nash and the Reverend James Lawson. Some had sat at the lunch counters, some had marched the picket lines, some were planning to take the nonviolent classes that were held in the basement of Jubilee Hall on Fisk's campus. My mother wanted to volunteer. Amid, amid this excitement, we ostensibly, the next generation of freedom fighters, were called into the living room briefly to greet guests before being banished to our beds. My, my, you're a big girl, how old are you? asked the handsome intern in glasses. I'm nine, and I can sing Gloria Lynn's I Should Care. <laughs> Want to hear it? I said, <laughs> stalling for time to gaze at these glamorous grown-ups grown with their perfumed cigarettes, pipes, and clinking wine glasses. 
I wanted to see these adults to listen to their stories, to be part of their ritual of sharing and laughter. Because the other one, the secret ritual of violence, shattered things to the point where we had to start all over again, picking up the broken pieces of our lives, moving back to normal. <coughs> home was home, and school was another thing. I think my mother took pride in the fact that we didn't miss school. Perhaps it was a way for both my parents to convince themselves that things weren't so bad, that they were really no different from any other parents trying to steer their children through certain racial and class-determined landmines. In school, I could get attention by obeying the rules and being smart. So I began to equate studying, and hard, studying hard and getting good grades with organization and perfection. While the grown-ups worried about sit-ins or picket lines at major department stores such as Harvey's and Kane Sloan, we focused on what we could control in our world, and that wasn't much. I was among the smart ones who could read, write, figure a little better than the rest, but we weren't especially close, um, and the artificial divisions disappeared almost entirely on the playground when we played jump rope or, or a hand clap or a circle game. We were obedient children, mostly being seen and not heard until the spring of 1962 when a new girl came to school. Though I think she entered the spring of our third grade year, my memory of Oprah doesn't become vivid until the fall of that year when we entered Mrs. Duncan's fourth grade class. By this time, the whole class had taken notice of her because she turned in her homework assignments early, even if we weren't asked to do so. And she knew enough Bible verses that Mrs. Duncan called her often to say the morning devotional. Curiosity and not a little envy soon turned to overt devotion and emulation among the girls, especially the ones used to getting called on by the teacher to read and recite and to take messages to the office. When we got to know Oprah better, we discovered she was on a mission to do the best she could do and to trust in the Lord. But she also liked to laugh and do, thing, do things other girls did. Deborah Bright and I were among the girls who responded to the urgency and conviction of Oprah's encouragement to do better, to be better, to believe and trust in God. What we did from moment to moment mattered. We mattered. To my nine-year-old mind, the idea of being good and letting that be my goal every day sounded like a solution to the problem of worrying about what tomorrow would bring or to try to control my home life or trying to control my own life. Now at nine years old, I didn't have a formal plan of conduct, but my goals were simple then, and being good was easier to imagine than to do. Sometimes this philosophy had unexpected consequences. When I tried to apply it to ballet, my attempts at precision must have looked to my teacher, Mrs. Love, like rigor mortis, <laughs> because she tried to bend my stiffened arm for a more natural look. For better or for worse, being good and doing well were my raison d'etre. Several girls in the class and I formed an all-girls group that stuck together in our beliefs and expressed our regard for each other by our fierce devotion to these simple principles. Once, for example, when Mrs. Duncan left the classroom on an errand, the fiercest girl in the class and a peripheral member of our group got into a nose-bloodying fight with one of the boys. Our group resolutely turned our chairs away from the fracas upon Oprah's insistence that we do our work, no matter that the fight pushed us closer and closer to the margins of the room, until our desks were pushed hard against the blackboard, our desks bunched in futile defense against the encroaching bodies of loud spectators, but we continued to copy Mrs. Duncan's neat script. At least we were exercising some control over our environment. Anyone peering in through the window would have thought we were a room of schizophrenics <laughs> or subjects of a bizarre experiment in which half the room responded to certain stimuli with abandon while the other half practiced fastidious control, noses <laughs> pressed almost against the blackboard. When my parents' disagreements threatened to turn the house upside down, I tried to follow Oprah's example of single-mindedness and purposefulness. 
I thought my close self-monitoring would somehow make them stop focusing on their differences to the exclusion of the daily order of things. But I cared too much about the combatants, and I couldn't read or write with a jumbled stomach and my heart in my mouth. I depended on Oprah's sense of urgency and conviction. Her remarkable talent for spelling, she was usually the last one standing in the spelling bee, her memorization of seemingly endless numbers of Bible verses, the straightness of her posture, the set of her mouth with the slight upside down smile on her chin, all these things fascinated and indeed uplifted me. And I think encouraged our group as a whole. Envy was subsumed in concentrating on the work. This was not the case with classmates outside our band of believers. On the playground, away from the watchful eyes of Mrs. Duncan, who held Oprah up to the class as a shining example, others, especially boys, teased her and told her to her face she was crazy. So we were, so were we for going along with her. The boys tried to give her nicknames that usually didn't stick because she seemed oblivious to them and she, if she could not avoid them, she faced them down and talked them away. Perhaps it was her stern, righteous demeanor or the way she spoke to them as if she knew with all her heart and soul that Jesus was coming again. Her energy and resolve with us standing beside her usually caused the most brazen boy to backpedal while pretending not to be intimidated. To be Oprah's friend was to believe with her in an all-powerful God who righted wrongs and looked out for little black girls. Oprah was on her way to Canaan land, and if you didn't go, she'd leave you in the dust of your own sins. Her conviction was somehow linked in my mind with my mother's recording of Porgy and Bess and Robert McFerrin's Porgy singing in his deep baritone, Oh Lord, I'm on my way. I'm on my way to Canaan land. It was a buoyant and precious and hopeful in the way that Porgy, in spite of his own crippled status, was traveling down the road to find his true love best as surely as Dorothy traveled down the yellow brick road to find the wizard. Porgy was going a long, long way to get someplace better to find his best. Oprah knew the way to Canaan land for little black girls with parent troubles or sister and brother troubles or teacher troubles. Maybe one day I brag to the group about my own powers of memorization and recitation. I don't exactly remember the occasion, but Oprah challenged me to memorize Invictus. When we talked years later, Deborah Wright Johnson, a girl I had known since first grade, reminded me that Oprah had challenged her as well to memorize the poem. This was not Mrs. Duncan's assignment, but one made by our peer, our leader. I boasted that I could memorize the poem in no time. I could not contain my excitement. I felt as relevant and present as daylight. Oprah's challenge to me was a gift and a goal. I didn't know anything about William Henley, didn't know he was white or that he was blind or that he'd written the poem while recovering from a serious illness. To me, the poem was about faith in beating the odds, about not simply surviving, but prevailing in the face of mountainous obstacles. The poem's first line incited no fear because I remembered Langston Hughes' poem, Celebrated People, the Color of Night. Out of the night that covers me, black as a pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever God's may be for my unconquerable soul. Bracing words for little middle-class black girls who for all practical purposes were invisible to the wider world. No Disney sponsored That's So Raven sitcoms featured little black girls and Diane Carroll's Julia was still a few years away. We were only beginning to see more black dolls on the market. In 1962, Barbie's costume and hair color came in all varieties, but not her skin tone. I didn't tell my parents of my peer assignment. I wasn't trying to keep it a secret, but I also didn't want to share it until I had mastered it. So I didn't tell them until I was ready to recite the poem, which took a couple of days. Memorizing the poem invigorated me. 
not in the way an Easter speech or at church or part in the school play would make me nervous or apprehensive. I had been asked to commit a poem to memory if for no other reason than to demonstrate my power of recall, commitment, and will. The day I memorized it, I waited with sweaty palms and a galloping heart while my mother, for my mother to get home from work. It just so happened that my father was home that day and I asked them to sit and listen to me recite the poem. They both looked surprised and pleased at my self-motivation and asked if I would recite outside. So out we went to the backyard. I remember the yard being unkempt with ball patches where we often played and a fence with missing staves where we had created an easy entrance to our neighbor's yard. But it was green and fragrant with new growth. My mother and father and my oldest sister sat on the concrete steps of the porch holding their knees. Go on, we're ready. I stood with my hands at my sides and recited the poem. As I spoke, the words took on a personal significance that resonated in the conviction of my delivery. When I finished, everyone clapped as if I had just given a concert at the Fisk Memorial Chapel. When's the program, my mother asked. Yeah, we, we didn't know anything about the program, my father said. There's no program. I just did it because Oprah asked me to do it, I said. At that moment, I might have looked exactly as I had in my class picture because I had chosen to wear my burgundy plaid cotton dress with my bright orange sweater, knee socks, and leather lace-up shoes, and I was smiling, showing those teeth which did not ma yet match my face. Oh, how nice, my parents said while looking a little puzzled. <laughs> Adults were accustomed to children dutifully reciting Easter or Christmas speeches chosen for them by their teachers. They were not accustomed to children giving themselves such work to do. Later in the week, I took a moment when Mrs. Duncan left the room to recite the poem for Oprah. I wanted to impress her more than I believed in and trusted any adults then. Oprah was pleased that I had accomplished this feat and proven my commitment to being as strong and as smart as I could be. Not long after that, she invited our little group to her house. We arrived after church and sipped punch, munched on sandwiches and cookies. Then Oprah asked us all to take a long walk in the woods with her. The woods near the Monroe home on Clay Street in North Nashville were appealing this time of year. I, I think it was mid-spring. The writer in me wants there to have been wild grass, skunk cabbage, and bluets. The writer in me wants to remember the sun passing its fingers of light through trees as we walked, giving us a sense of peace and quiet. What's true is I was fully engaged. And the other girls were too, because in spite of our differences in personality and taste, this green space induced a self, a kind of self-forgetting. It was a place to skip and chatter and be girls together. I was tickled to be there. At the same time, I knew this was a special gathering. We never had one like it again. Even if we had birthday parties or parties at the recreation center, we never had one like that one. And even if sentiment has gilded this memory, making the trees greener and the light brighter, what's really important is being out there in that space granted us all time to breathe and matter to each other in the moment to talk about those things we were interested in. We were content to be. I was gaining a sense of self-awareness and self-possession, and my mother noticed. One day I heard her talking on the phone to one of her sisters. I don't know what's gotten into her. Since she's taken up with her classmate, she wants to read the Bible. She says she wants to be saved. But there's something else I can't put my finger on. I had actually asked my mother if I could be saved, to which she smiled and answered, you already saved. You've been saved since you were two years old, and your grandfather christened you in the Presbyterian Church. But I want to be dipped in the river, washed clean, I answered, thinking the more dramatic ceremony was somehow more authentic, more lasting. Well, let's wait and see. If you still want to do it in a year, we'll see was all she said. She smiled and 
shook her head as she returned to folding clothes. Just when I was beginning to see myself as someone separate from my family, someone who thought separate thoughts and felt separate feelings, Oprah moved away. She was gone by the beginning of our fifth grade school year. I didn't communicate with my school friends during the summer, so I didn't know who to ask for her address, even if I had thought to write her a letter. She had been the animus of our group, though we couldn't have articulated it then. Her absence impoverished my social life at school and also my imaginative life at home. I think the other girls felt it too because we drifted back into our former loose social groupings of twos and threes. Deborah Bright and I grew closer that year, not speaking of Oprah, but persisting in our own way in our pursuit of the right thing to do and be. But I must say, in spite of my best efforts, I was a little lost. For a while, I acted out my disappointment and grief by deliberately doing things to alienate my friends and family. By the fall of my fifth grade year, Dr. King had already given his I Have a Dream speech in Washington, D.C., and in what has now become known as the March on Washington. And President Kennedy was assassinated in November of 63. We students were lined up in the corridor and told to be still and be quiet while the teachers gathered around TV sets to get the latest developments of the news. I was discovering that the world was a hostile place and there were people in the world who cared nothing about being good or kind, who in fact craved blood. None of this stopped the ongoing personal wars of my parents. I couldn't control what they did and I couldn't talk about it but I could use the new curse words I'd learned on the playground. One day, walking home from school with my friends, I deliberately used every curse word I could think of in as many combinations as I could think of to use them. Deborah and the other girls asked me to stop, and then walked ahead of me rather than endure my foul mouth. At home, my new sense of relative personal autonomy had equally mixed results. <laughs> One day, my mother had to leave the house suddenly, so she didn't have time to get a babysitter. So she put my oldest sister, my then 11-year-old sister, in charge and told us to do our homework and sit on the couch until she returned. I had other things in mind besides sitting on the couch and decided instead to don my best Sunday dress with blue flowerettes on a flared skirt. I was like the little girl with the curl when she was bad. <laughs> round and round the house, I danced in my finery, and I said horrid things to my brothers and oldest sister who were offended by my imperious manner and demonstrated their displeasure by chasing me around the house, which caused me to tear and stain my beautiful dress. My mother arrived home to a great commotion and a house that looked as if it had been ransacked. I was acting the part of the distressed princess in what was left of my dress. But mama was all I had a chance to say. <laughs> as my brothers and sisters recounted how I was the instigator, what could I say in my defense? I was wearing the evidence. <laughs> My mother wasted no time in disabusing me of any notion that I was a distressed princess. <laughs> Young lady, you march in your room and take that dress off. I don't know what's gotten into you, but I will not tolerate this behavior. Get me that strap. Yes, that one. By the time Oprah moved to Na back to Nashville, my family and I had moved first to Mississippi, then to Houston, Texas. That was also the last time I saw most of the girls in our group. For a while, I missed our camaraderie. Not that I had shared confidences with Deborah or Oprah or any of my school friends, nor do I know how much they shared with each other. But in 1962 and 63, we gave each other ourselves with a purity of heart that is the measure of innocence, love, faith, loyalty, yes, and willingness to believe together against all naysayers in a dream of our personal best. Not always in the attainment of it, 
but in the pursuit of it. Oprah and those little girls back in Nashville were the first to give me a sense of myself as powerful and capable. And for that, I will be forever grateful. Of the girls who were part of our group, I've kept in contact with Deborah Bright, now Deborah Bright Johnson, who still lives in Nashville and is a successful executive with the telephone company. Deborah of the big eyes, long bangs, ponytail, and broad smile, as bright now it was, as it was when we were in school together, keeps up with some of our classmates, many of whom have gone on to have busy careers and families. Once during my freshman year at college, uh, back at Fisk University, I saw one of the fiercest members of our group, of our former group, leaning against a car, car at a hamburger stand. She was the one who would get into the fist fight with boys and declare how tough she was as she wiped her bloody nose. She looked weary for all her 18 years. We spoke, but she didn't recognize me or seemed not to do so. I've seen Oprah sporadically over the years, never long enough to ask her in person about our girls group. But once when I wrote her a letter and reminded her of our hike in the woods near Clay Street, she wrote me back to say she remembered our fourth grade class. Our girlhood is literally a lifetime removed from the women we've become. Young people, especially those reared in the South, address me as professor or ma'am. And people at poetry readings ask me what inspired me to become a poet I tell them about getting a diary in the fifth grade. I tell them about loving Dr. Seuss at three years old or discovering Emily Dickinson and Langston Hughes in the third grade. I don't usually tell them I was once an ashy-legged girl with new permanent teeth who memorized Invictus on Oprah's dare. Now Oprah leads thousands of women and men from all walks of life, from all over the, from all over the world in her role as television icon. Proof of her influence is the school for girls she founded in South Africa in 2006. And I think since then she's founded many schools. Perhaps she sees in these young South African girls energy and idealism of her younger self, fiercely committed to making a difference in the world, to living by her principles, helping others realize their potential. I cherish the memory of all the girls in my fourth grade class, Deborah Bright, Fonchetta Darden, Annie Davis, Monica Fenton, Deborah McKell, Vanessa Reese, Cassandra Claiborne, Oprah Winfrey, Bessie Smith, Franchetta Stokes, Lynn Vaughn, Anita Witherspoon, and those whose names I have forgotten. As with any place, the Wharton Elementary School I attended exists only in what I remember of it. The building is still there, but the name has been changed. Still the Wharton I knew and the girls I laughed and cried and learned with in 1962 shaped me, lifted me up, strengthened me strengthened my confidence in my abilities and led me to discover the power of words and my lifelong fascination with them. I discovered too the necessity of perseverance in the face of obstacles and to take the high road even when it's not feasible or popular. I haven't always taken the high road. Often I've come miserably short of my mark, but when the odds were against me, I have used my childhood experience as a touchstone to motivate me one more time or one more again, as we said back in the day. In 2004, in the first 24 hours after I had major surgery for the removal of a malignant brain tumor, I was unaware of my inability to control my emotions or my thoughts, a consequence of being administered significant doses of powerful steroids and anti-seizure medication. I recall singing out loud, and when my husband had gone home for a change of clothes, calling for someone to hold my hand during that long first night. I don't remember when they moved me to my, my room, but when they did, one of the first things I did was to call a group of young residents together to tell them of my fourth grade class. <laughs> and my friendship with Oprah, as if my former relationship with her would somehow make them work harder to assist in my recovery. 
I felt vulnerable and incomplete, as if the neurosurgeons had, ex had excised more than the tumor, as if they had taken my memories and my humanity as well. Perhaps I was doing a reflexive exercise in memory retrieval. The residents took note and left when I finished what must have seemed to them to be a delusional story at best. I don't know what I was trying to communicate, but surely in my desperation, I wanted them to know how precious my life, life, my life was to me. Steroidal psychosis, yes. But the very act of remembering affirms my life, confirmed I was still among the living. I don't know what this anecdote proves, except my experience as a girl of faith has stayed with me for better and for worse all my life. Maybe the very fact that we were pursuing something that started from our own inner visions made all the difference in the world. We were children pursuing a state of grace, no matter the outcome. In Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower, an intriguing and prophetic futuristic novel about life in these United States, the main character, Lauren Olamina, says, if God is change, then we can shape change and in so doing, shape our destiny. Her concept sounds innovative, but at heart she's saying what William Henley said all those years ago, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Words to carry with us on the road to Canaan. Thank you. Oh, do you have any questions? Is it published yet? What's the well? What's the actually? Schedule? A version of it is published right here that I read in Shaping Memories: Reflections of African American Women Writers, edited by Joanne Gabin, who is also on the board of the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. So it's and it's. It's going to um, uh, be in, in my book, a chapter in, in my, my book. Okay. Yes, Nancy. Well, I know this is just one chapter, but I, I'm curious, are you going to reflect back your childhood and forward in the other chapters of the yeah, book? Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm not going to do it in a sequential way. Uh -huh. um, I'm going to choose what you know, moments to talk about that I think are interesting. And right now I'm working on the, um, I'm working on two things. One is about creating art from trauma and Roberta Culbertson and I have talked often about it. You know, how do you do that? And um, I think about one of the passages in, in there that I, that I have in there and uh, I see Deborah McDowell in the audience, and I know she knows the quotation, um, the blues is the impulse to um, keep alive the details of a painful experience, um, to finger the jagged grain. So I'm working on that particular idea and, and what its implications are in um, different um, genres. Yes, Roberta. Thank you very much. That was really, really a wonderful talk and wonderful reading. And um, I guess I wanted to ask you, I've always been impressed with the way in which you have a rhythm to your presentation, to your speech. And does that come from your mother and the piano and that time as well, some of the other things you were talking about? And then also, why is it that at times you'll even sing part of what you, t what you read? And, <laughs> and just, you know, talk about that a little bit. Well, yeah, my mother um, um, was 
a phenomenal musician and her sister as well. And in fact, growing up in her family, they had a, you know, a band, the family, her father was, was a schoolmaster at, um, in Oxford, North Carolina at uh, Mary Potter School. And, um, you know, and they, so the family was kind of disciplined and everybody played an instrument. And music just, and as someone who, and you know, she used to teach us stuff like the, the, the music that you were hearing as you walked in was the music from an upcoming um, CD called Deliver Yourself. And um, she used to teach, and on there is a ditty that she used to teach us that I have taught my grandchildren. It's uh, John the Rabbit. Everything had rhythm, you know. Oh, John the Rabbit, oh yes. The children would say, oh yes. Mm -hmm. Had a mighty bad habit, oh, oh yes. yes. Of going to my garden, oh yes. And eating up my peas. Oh, yes. And eating up my carrots. Oh, yes. He hates tomatoes. Oh, yes. And sweet potatoes. Oh, yes. And if I live oh, yes. to see next fall, oh, yes. then I won't plant oh, yes. a garden at all. Yes. <laughs> My grandchildren do the oh, yes part. Sometimes they say, Nana, we want to do the other part. You say, oh, yes. But yeah, everything, uh, you know, it can be a little obsessive sometimes, but <laughs> what, can I, what can I say? Thank you. Anyone else? Another question? Yes. I was just, you know, wonderfully blown away by the whole talk. And I, as you were a quarter of the way in, I, I, I think I had the thought that what a, what a picture of a, of a soul, of a full life, of a full soul. Not only that you had it then, but somehow that you were able to extract all of it now for us so richly, so many parts to it. And I was, I'm just thinking of your role as an instructor of creative writing and things like that. And I was thinking like, if I send myself back to being nine years old, I, I really felt deficient in comparison to your story. <laughs> and yet, I know that I played in the sandbox with dinosaurs, with friends. We had, we theorized, we made make-believe worlds. We talked about music, and the, there was a younger one and an old, and I was older, and I insisted on things. And they, I know that, I imagine there is something full in all of those experiences that I could uh, write about. And of course what you've done here is an essay as opposed to a poem, so it's wonderful that you do both. And I'm just wondering what do you tell, what do you think of that, uh, of, of, of your own, uh, your own ability to, to, on the one hand there's the question of whether your experience is simply objectively richer because of all of the, I mean, it, 1962, in the south where you were, incredibly profound time. And that might not have been true in the suburb of, of Kansas City, Missouri, like where I'm from. Uh, what, how, how do you approach the panoply of many students that come to you in terms of their goals of saying something as rich as what you've just described to us today. What, what's your approach to that? It's a good question. When, if, you know, many of you in here who um, are, who teach, know that as a teacher, with, when your students see you on a daily basis, they, they're not in, as impressed. <laughs> um, and they will see you in all, you know, on a good day and they'll see you on a bad day. And sometimes even what is a strength in terms of, you know, in, in, write, in your writing might not necessarily be a strength in the classroom, you know, so that, you know, I, I, 
when I talked, when I said about what I said about perfection and organization um, and order, those are the banes of my existence. So that, you know, it's hard for me to talk and stay on the point unless I have a script in front of me. You know, I might go off the subject if I step away from the desk. You know, then I'm liable to go anywhere. And sometimes students will say, well, yeah, she knows what she's talking about, but eh, you know, the woman goes all over the place. <laughs> so, um, but what I tell students in creative writing, um, we usually do fiction. So, but even so, I tell them to, if it's, if it's true for you, if it's something that you've had a a real experience and you want to incorporate that into a story, make sure you're not too close to that experience. Make sure it's something that you're ready to let go of and then to play with it and fiddle with it. Um, because 10 or 11 years ago when I was at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities and working on a story similar to this one, I tried to make it fiction, you know, and I had this character's name picked out because I didn't want to um, be exploitative um, with the life of someone who had gone on to do great things. And I, so I wanted, well, what is the balance of that? But it's my story too. So how do I work that? So it took me a long time. I wrote out several versions of it. And when I submitted it for this um, anthology, you know, Joanne worked with me and, and everything. And um, finally she said, you should just tell a true story. And that freed me up. You know, I could use novelistic techniques, but um, yeah, I, I still tell it true story. Thank you so much, Romain. See, one right. more question one from more. Me, oh, her. Oh, here you go. That's OK. You can ask right now. One more. Oh, thank you for this wonderful reading. I'm so glad to be here. Um, my question was um, sort of prompted by uh, some of the questions that have been asked here already. Right. Um, but I was kind of curious how, as an adult, you recovered your ch childhood voice, you know, in your narrative. You talk as a child, but you were an adult writing it. So how did you negotiate that space from adult to child? And what's the secret of that? I don't know if there is a secret. I, I, I think, you know, when I, I looked back at my childhood, some, one of the things that made it easier was having, I'm going to tell my age here, having grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And they brought back all the <coughs> games that, you know, I used to play. And, and there's a certain age when you can tell a, a child anything. You know, at about, between about two and four, they will absorb all the games you want to play. And so I really wanted to play with them and to just love them up. <laughs> and um, so I pulled out games. My daughter said, you didn't play that with me. <laughs> <laughs> but with her, I had to be a grown-up. I had to be her mother. With them, I can play with them. You know, they say, Nana, you gonna play with us? Yeah. <laughs> We're gonna play. And my daughter actually has to tell us, you know, settle down. <laughs> you know. So I think that's that has a lot to do with it to have the experience of being with young people, you know, and um, and of course inside yourself. You have words that you have saved up that if you go back to that moment, they'll come back.
thank you for the map.